infrared, people. Look sharp. What's happening, eh, Paul? Can't see anything in here. Pull your team out, Gorman. Jesus. Maybe they don't show up on infrared at all. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and today we'll be exploring the 1986 sci-fi blockbuster, Aliens, starring Sigourney Weaver, Bill Paxton, Paul Reiser, Michael Bean, Lance Henriksen, Al Matthews, and Carrie Henn. Written and directed by James Cameron and starring Sigourney Weaver as Ellen Ripley, the protagonist and sole survivor of Ridley Scott's Alien, the film follows Ripley, who was persuaded to head back to LV-426, the then barren moon where her crew encountered a hostile alien that wiped them all out. Only this time, she's accompanied by an elite unit of marines sent there to discover why the settlers, scientists and families that now lived on the planet and were employed by Weyli Jutani were no longer responding to messages being sent there from Earth. Though still a thrilling picture, Aliens is to Alien what Terminator 2 Judgment Day was to the Terminator, in that it's louder and more action-packed, while still expanding on the concepts explored in the first films. This, along with Predator, were for the majority of my childhood the most rewatched movies I owned on VHS. Having first watched Aliens as a child, alone, in the middle of the night, following a traumatic family experience, many of the scenes in this film both scarred and excited me in ways that's difficult to explain. Perhaps it was my family issues and feelings of parental abandonment featured in the story that resonated with me, or maybe I enjoyed being scared, thrilled and excited by the endless possibilities that sci-fi films had to offer. Whatever the reasons, Aliens is very dear to me, and I would have to say it's probably my favourite film of all time. With the critical and commercial success of Ridley Scott's Alien in 1979, which revolved around the crew of a commercial space tugboat called the Nostromo, encountering a hostile species on an unknown planet which proceeded to grow in size and wipe them all out, leading to a claustrophobic and tense encounter with Ripley, there was no doubt that a sequel would be in order. But this idea was put on the back burner as leadership at 20th Century Fox began changing hands shortly after the release of the film. By the time that 1983 had arrived, one of the producers of Alien, David Geiler, wrote a speculative script for Alien 2, which he envisioned as a cross between the 1960 western The Magnificent Seven and the 1981 action thriller Southern Comfort. Written by his longtime friend and collaborator, Walter Hill, who also worked as a producer on the first Alien film. Development executive Larry Wilson then came across James Cameron's screenplay for The Terminator and passed it on to Geiler. Geiler then approached the young filmmaker, who was then in pre-production for The Terminator. As a fan of Ridley Scott's masterpiece, Cameron stated that he was interested in working on the sequel, and reportedly worked in seclusion for a few days, brainstorming a concept for Alien 2. When he'd handed the 45-page treatment over to Fox, the film was put on hiatus, with some complaining the first film didn't make enough to warrant a sequel, and others simply not liking the idea he'd proposed. With the nine-month delay in filming for The Terminator due to a scheduling conflict as Schwarzenegger was still filming Conan the Destroyer, Cameron was given more time to work on a new script for the production company. The producers and Fox's new president were so impressed with the new treatment that Cameron was told that if his passion project The Terminator became a success, he would be able to direct Alien 2 himself, and the rest is of course history. Given three years to work his magic, Cameron began drawing inspiration for the alien story from the Vietnam War, a conflict which saw a seemingly technologically superior force being defeated in a hostile environment, with the director stating that their training and technology in the film were inappropriate for the specifics of the conflict they were in, and that can be seen as analogous to the inability of superior firepower to conquer the unseen enemy in Vietnam. The director also listed Robert Heinlein's novel Starship Troopers as a big influence of the themes and phrases seen in the film, with references to drops and the bug hunts lifted from the conflict with the arachnids, as well as the cargo loading exoskeletons we get to see. What's the question? Is this going to be a stand up fight, sir, or another bug hunt? Bay 12, please. 
Though the designs of the xenomorphs and resin used to portray the hive were based directly off of H.R. Geiger's nightmarish designs for Alien, everything from the design of the Solaco, the power loaders, the colony on LV-426, to even the Alien Queen, were all initially designed by James Cameron, who had a background in special effects. These initial drafts were then given to the special effects crew and Stan Winston, who handled the practical effects for them to perfect. While Aliens would go on to become an overwhelming success, the production process was mired with conflict between James Cameron and the UK crew that had been hired to work on the film. With only one film under his belt, which none of the crew had seen, many people working on the film behind the scenes showed contempt towards the young director, and often went out of their way to make the shoot difficult. From taking unnecessary tea breaks after he'd spent hours preparing a shot, leaving him to continue with the skeleton crew, to simply walking out of scenes when they disagreed with his vision. An example of this can be seen in the final scenes depicting the alien hive filled with facehuggers. There was supposed to be a thick layer of mist covering the bottom half of the eggs, but because the crew had walked out after Cameron and the actors waited over two hours for the smoke to fill the room, all the smoke went out of the studio as each crew member opened the exit doors, leaving some of the scenes filled with smoke while others only had a small amount. Cameron had initially wanted to use a predominantly UK cast, but after unsuccessfully auditioning thousands of applicants, American actors were instead chosen, including Michael Bean, Lance Henriksen, and the late Bill Paxton, all of whom had worked on The Terminator with him. I think that the hiring of an American cast on what the crew believed was a UK production also spurred further animosity towards the director. Hey Vasquez, have you ever been mistaken for a man? No. Have you? <laughs> Oh, Vasquez. <laughs> he just too bad. The entire group of actors who played the Marines were given a strict contract, including the requirement of them reading Robert Heinlein's novel Starship Troopers, and them also having to undergo military training together so that they could form real relationships and develop a sense of camaraderie prevalent in the film. All right, people, on the running line. Are you me? Yeah! me? Yeah! yeah. Where are you? Get on the ready line, Marines! Get down to die! Further strengthening the believability of the Space Marines in the picture was the casting of Val Matthews as Gunnery Sergeant Apone. Matthews was actually a member of the United States Marine Corps. He held 13 combat awards and decorations, including two Purple Hearts, and was the first Black Marine in the 1st Maritime Division in Vietnam to be meritoriously promoted to the rank of Sergeant. His experiences and on-screen presence were invaluable, as he was able to correct and advise the Marines in the film on how to hold their weapons, how soldiers would behave, and how they would move in formation. We had things where everyone's instinct is automatically to put their fingers on the trigger. Well, they stopped doing that on the set with me because I don't have it. Sigourney Weaver, William Hope, and Paul Reiser were absent from the military training due to scheduling issues, but Cameron ultimately believed that this suited their characters as outsiders. The most difficult role to cast in the film was of course that of the traumatized Newt, who in the film witnesses the death of her parents in horrific conditions and is forced to hide in air vents to survive. The problem with this casting was that most of the children that were auditioned were used to smiling in commercials, whereas Newt's character was dark and didn't have that much to smile about. Carrie Hen was eventually chosen after an incredible audition, despite the fact that she had no acting experience, and her daughter-mother dynamic with Ripley, who loses a daughter of her own, adds a deeper layer of depth to the film. Aliens seem to really bring it all together in terms of, of design, and uh, that's, what, uh, that's what attracted me to the project, the opportunity to create another world. Aliens was filmed over 10 months on a modest budget of 18 million at Pinewood Studios in England, almost twice the amount used to make the first Alien movie. While the film cost three times more than what Cameron had spent to make the outstanding Terminator movie, he found the deadline and budget to be constricting, which is further hampered by what Bill Paxton described as the indentured working practices of the British crew. I think it's also important to note that many of the people involved on the project had worked on Alien under Ridley Scott and were frustrated that the 30 year old Cameron had taken over his vision. Further complicating the production process was arguments that Cameron had with the original director of photography, Dick Bush, who insisted on lighting the alien nest brightly, while the director insisted on a dark maze-like environment for the nest that was only lit by the lights the marines had on their armour. Wishing to curb their lack of enthusiasm, Cameron arranged the screening of the Terminator, which at that point hadn't been released in the UK, but many of the crew members didn't attend. 
Those that did watch the movie, however, developed trust in his ability to helm the project, and though the viewing wasn't as successful as he'd hoped, I definitely think that this helped push the project along. The outstanding score for Aliens was composed by the late James Horner, who, throughout his long film history, has written, composed, conducted, and orchestrated over a hundred film scores, predominantly featuring a signature style of integrated choral and electronic elements. Though Horner was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Original Score, his first of many, he genuinely thought that he was not given enough time to work on the music for the film. The composer had arrived in England and was given six weeks to write the score, but due to the fact that filming and editing were still taking place, he was unable to view the film. To make matters worse, he was given an outdated recording space at Abbey Road Studios, which could barely integrate synthesizers or electronic equipment that Horner required to achieve the sound he envisioned for the film. Though he'd requested the film's release to be pushed back four weeks to give him time to finish the score, this was denied and he along with the London Symphony Orchestra were forced to record the entire score in four days. Given the limited time he had on the project and the stressful environment he had to work in, Horner was ultimately unsatisfied with the score that he created. But I still think that the music and Aliens along with the cinematography were both integral to the high octane and stress inducing feel to the picture and the sense of hopelessness and isolation they portray. In the opening of the film, we see a spacecraft drifting slowly through space. Inside is Ripley, the only survivor from the previous movie, having escaped in the shuttle of the mining ship Nostromo, which she blew up after an aggressive and hostile alien species had decimated her crew. Now, Ripley is still in peaceful cryogenic sleep with the crew's pet cat, Jones, and is eventually rescued by a salvage vessel, before being transported to Gateway Station, a space facility orbiting Earth where she regains consciousness in a hospital. Ripley is then visited by Carter Burke, a representative of her employers, Wayland Jutani, and when she states that she did not recognize the seemingly advanced medical bay, Burke informs her that she had been in hypersleep for 57 years, her spacecraft having drifted through space until the salvage vessel discovered it by a very fortunate coincidence, which meant that everyone that she once knew had now likely passed. This unfortunately also included her daughter Amanda, who died of cancer at the age of 68 while Ripley was asleep. Devastated, Ripley whispers that she'd promised her daughter that she would be back for her 11th birthday before going off on the Nostromo, and this scene is important as it explains the bond that Ripley begins developing with Newt, the sole survivor of the catastrophe that had befallen the settlement on LV-426. Further compounding the stress she was under were recurring nightmares she'd experienced in which the titular alien in its early life cycle as a chestburster begins to poke out of her chest, just as it had done with her crewmate Kane in the previous film. Given that she'd essentially blown up the expensive cargo ship in an attempt to escape the clutches of the sole xenomorph that terrorized the Nostromo, our protagonist is forced to sit through a board hearing with the company questioning Ripley about her role in its destruction. During the inquiry, Ripley desperately tries to convince the board of the dangerous nature of the alien and the potential threat of the derelict ship, which still contains hundreds of eggs. She explains that the company policies at the time gave the Nostromo crew orders to obtain the creature, which killed the crew and caused the destruction of the ship. However, the board is extremely skeptical of Ripley's testimony, and because she'd admitted to having destroyed the Nostromo with no evidence of the creature being found, the company decides not to press criminal charges, but revokes her flight license and submits her to a psychiatric evaluation. Upon asking why no one will go to the planetoid to confirm her story, Ripley is shocked to learn that the planetoid, now known as LV-426, was in the process of being terraformed over the past 30 years, with whole families working there to create a breathable atmosphere, thus making the planet more hospitable. At the colony headquarters on LV-426, and some time after the inquiry, two company employees discuss recently received company orders to investigate a certain unsurveyed part of the surface of the planetoid, which was in actual fact the precise location that Ripley had told the company her crew had discovered the derelict alien ship filled with alien eggs. A surveyor working with his wife, son Timmy, and daughter Rebecca, who was affectionately called Newt, is sent to the location and discovers the same derelict ship previously found by Ripley's crew. He and his wife go in to investigate, but after a very long while, the wife comes back and calls for help on the radio, while her husband is seen lying on the ground with a face hugger attached to his face. Released on her own recognizance, Ripley gets an apartment at Gateway Station and is visited by Burke, who is accompanied by Lieutenant Gorman of the Colonial Marines. Burke tells Ripley that contact with the colony on LV-426 had suddenly been lost, and fearing that aliens were responsible, the company intended to send a squadron of marines, with Ripley serving as an advisor, as she had personal experiences with the species. As a further incentive, Wade and Jutani agreed to reinstate Ripley as a warrant officer, on the condition that she went. 
Now Ripley initially refuses, as she dreaded going back to the place where she first encountered the alien, but as her nightmares continued, she decides that if she did not go on the mission, she would never find any peace. She then calls Burke, and when he assures her that the mission to LV-426 was to eradicate the aliens, not to study or capture them, she agrees to join the mission. Aboard the spaceship USS Sulaco, she's introduced to the Colonial Marines, and their mission parameters are explained. But when she attempts to give them a briefing on her encounter with the Xenomorph, most of the soldiers ridicule her, not realising the hellish nightmare they're about to descend into. To make matters worse, the discovery that one of the men on board was an android sends Ripley into a frenzy. This is due to the android in the previous film named Ash and portrayed by the outstanding Ian Home, jeopardizing the lives of her crew to fulfill a secret mission given to him by Weyland Yutani to bring the xenomorph specimen back to Earth. A dropship delivers the expedition to the surface of LV-426, but when they arrive at the settlement, they find the colony base deserted. Inside, they discover makeshift barricades and battle sites, alluding to an intense conflict that must have occurred, but surprisingly, no bodies are found. They also find two live facehuggers in containment tanks, and a traumatised young girl named Newt, who appeared to be the sole survivor. The Marines eventually locate the colonists, grouped together beneath the fusion-powered atmosphere processing station, and assume that they must have barricaded themselves in to stay safe. Given that their targets had been found, the soldiers begin heading to the location to attempt a rescue, descending into corridors covered in alien secretions. But once they arrive at the centre of the station, the marines find the colonists cocooned, serving as incubators for the creature's offspring. After a chest burster erupts out of the chest of a colonist, the nearby soldiers kill it, rousing multiple adult aliens who begin ambushing the marines, killing and capturing many of them who were caught off guard. When the inexperienced Gorman panics, Ripley assumes command of the operation by taking control of their armoured personnel carrier, and directs it towards the nest to rescue the remaining marines. It's in this moment that Ripley's fear is overridden by a compulsion to help others that she knew were doomed, and we see this resurface at the end of the film as she goes up against the entire alien horde and the alien queen single-handedly to rescue Newt, transforming her from a victim and survivor to a hero. After Ripley rescues the soldiers that were left, Hicks orders the dropship to recover the survivors, but a stowaway alien kills the pilots, causing it to crash into the station and forcing the group to barricade themselves inside. It's around this time that Ripley discovers Burke was the one that had ordered the colonists to investigate the derelict spaceship containing the alien eggs after the inquiry, where she had given details about her experiences with the hostile species. She threatens to expose him, but Bishop then informs the group that the crashed dropship had damaged a power plant's cooling system, which meant that the entire facility was about to explode, raising the stakes even further. While understandably distrustful of the android at first, when he volunteers to crawl through extensive piping conduits to reach the colony's transmitter and remotely pilot the Solarco's remaining dropship to the surface, she begins to see him as an ally. Scared that he was about to be outed as scum back on Earth, and wanting to sneakily smuggle the aliens back to Earth through quarantine, Burke releases the two facehuggers they'd found earlier into the medical laboratory where Ripley and Newt were sleeping, hoping that they would lay their eggs inside of them. This leads to one of the tensest and most expertly executed anxiety-inducing scenes in the film, with Ripley and Newt trying to survive while being trapped in the room. But after a brief struggle, Ripley is able to trigger the fire alarm, alerting the marines to the crisis who rescue them and kill the creatures. The power is then suddenly cut and all hell breaks loose as the aliens begin assaulting the group from the ceiling. In the ensuing firefight, Burke flees but is cornered by an alien and killed. Hudson is also captured after covering the retreat of his comrades and both Gorman and the injured Vasquez sacrifice themselves to stall the aliens. To make matters worse, Hicks is also injured and Newt gets captured. Though they now have the opportunity to leave, Ripley refuses to abandon Newt, she had abandoned her daughter, and we see the now heavily armed Ripley enter the hive and rescue Newt from the aliens who drew first blood. As they escape, the two encounter the alien queen and her egg chamber, in a memorable standoff where Ripley signals to the queen to tell her xenomorph guards to back off and let them escape, or face the fiery fury of her flamethrower, which would be used to eradicate her children if she didn't comply. But when a facehugger begins to leave its egg and move towards them, Ripley uses her flamethrower and grenade launcher to destroy the eggs as well as the queen's ovipositor. Pursued by the enraged Queen, Ripley and Newt reunite with Bishop and Hicks on the dropship, with all of them escaping moments before the station explodes and destroys the entire facility. But unfortunately for the survivors now on the Solarco, they are ambushed by the Queen who stowed away in the ship's landing gear. The Queen tears Bishop in half and advances on Newt, but Ripley battles the creature using an exosuit cargo loader and expels it through an airlock into space. 
The film ends with Ripley preparing Newt, Hicks, and what's left of Bishop for hypersleep, and the journey back to Earth. But after the ending credits, we hear the sound of the howling wind and a scurrying facehugger, alluding to the possibility that one may have gotten on board the Salako. I only noticed this for the first time while watching the movie again recently, and was surprised to find that the doomed fate of Hicks, Newt, and Bishop in Alien 3 was actually foreshadowed in this film. Jim, to make this look like it's going faster, would undercrank the camera, shoot it at uh, 18 or 20 frames a second instead of the regular 24. So when you play it back at normal speed, it looks like the vehicle's moving faster. APC in the foreground, and then the camera was dolling in front of it, so we actually were mixing scales to give the illusion of, of depth. So uh, it was all done in camera. Adding to the believability of the film was the fact that almost all of the effects were done in camera, using a combination of reprojection, miniatures, and practical effects. Brothers Robert and Dennis Skotak, who'd worked on a few films that Cameron was involved in, were brought on to supervise the visual effects, as not only were they talented in that field, but also because like Cameron, they were illustrators and designers capable of making storyboards, costume, and set designs on the go. Filming the miniature scenes were said to have been difficult, especially when they had to shoot outdoors because of the weather, with both the rain and winds blowing over props, forcing the crew to often reset and redress the scenes. This, however, also proved quite useful, as it accurately captured the harsh elements and weather of LV-426, which was still in the process of being terraformed. Whereas Alien only had one person in a xenomorph suit, the addition of multiple aliens in the sequel, who for the most part were seen performing more acrobatic movements, meant that the costume department had to go about H.R. Geiger's initial designs in a completely different way. To this end, the suits were constructed to be more flexible and durable to allow the stunt actors, dancers, and gymnasts, who were all used at different times of the shoot, to crawl, walk, and jump with the suits on. Though when it came to the more dangerous scenes that involved the aliens being blown up or run over, specifically designed design mannequins were used to facilitate this. But when it comes to discussing the visual effects in the film, I'd be remiss not to mention the colossal task that was bringing the massive xenomorph queen seen in the finale to light. Under the supervision of practical effects wizard Stan Winston, a life-size model was created so that the crew could experiment with its movements. The practical effects team then flew to England during the production stage and built a larger version of the Queen that was over 14 feet tall and was operated using a mixture of over a dozen puppeteers, control rods, hydraulics, cables, and a crane to support its enormous weight. One of the reasons the Queen looks amazing is that all of her sequences, like most of the effects in the movie, were filmed in camera, requiring no post-production editing. This, the practical effects, and the overall success of the film as a whole is a testament to Cameron's directorial genius, with the man envisioning many complex shots and problem solving in his own mind how they could achieve them without requiring post-production special effects as a crux to fall back on. Everything from using the miniatures with forced perspective, reversing shots that were near impossible to achieve normally, to even flipping the camera upside down to give the illusion that the aliens were crawling on the roof is the reason that this is one of the most successful sci-fi films of all time, and one of the first to be recognised by the Academy, with the film being nominated for seven Academy Awards including Best Actress for Weaver's Performance, Best Original Score, Best Sound, Best Film Editing, and Best Art Direction, while winning in the categories of Best Sound Effects Editing and Visual Effects. Well, that's all for today, folks. A big thanks to all of you guys who requested we explore aliens. Don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notification icon to stay up to date on all my content. And if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film and Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Movement. Signal's clean. Range 20 meters. They found a way in. Something we missed. We didn't miss anything. 18. Seven. Six. It can't be. That's inside the room. It's reading right, man. Look. Well, you're not reading it right. Five meters, man. Four.